Hi there, this is Optics Lesson 2, and this one is Critical Angle and Total Internal Reflection. So let's start off with some recap questions from last lesson, so let's pause and have a go. So the first one, what is the speed of light in glass of refractive index 1.42? So remember the one point, refractive index 1.42 just simply means it'll be a factor of 1.42 slower than the speed of light in air, or in a vacuum, so it's 3 times 10 to the 8. Divided by 1.42, which gives us the speed of light in this glass of 2.1 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. Pretty straightforward. Let's have a look at another one. So if you want to pause and complete this one, and then I'll take you through the answer. So the diagram shows a ray of light traveling in air, an incident on a glass block of refractive index 1.5. What is the angle of refraction in the glass? So, first of all, we need we need the angle measured from the normal. So we need this one. So we need to do 90 minus 35 to give us that angle. So that's 55 degrees. And then we just need to apply Snell's law. So M1 sine theta 1 is equal to N2 sine theta 2. And we've got the angle of refraction in the glass, so we're looking for theta 2. So that would be theta 2 is equal to, so it's inverse sine, sine minus 1, of m1 sine theta 1, divided by n2. So we just need to put some numbers in, so it's inverse sine. n1 is air, so that's just 1, times sine 55. Divided by the refractive index of the second material, which is the glass, which is 1.5. And if you calculate that, you should get 33 degrees. Which makes sense. We've gone from a less optically dense material to a more opt optically dense material. So the angle of refraction should get smaller compared to the angle of incidence. And 33 is smaller than 55, so we're okay. Let's move on. So critical angle, theta C, and TIR, which means total internal reflection. There's a property of light when it travels in a media, whereby at a specific angle, called the critical angle, which we've got here is theta 1 equals C, the light would refract across the boundary at 90 degrees. So critical angle says here, this is the angle of incidence theta 1 that result in an angle of refraction theta 2 of 90 degrees. So let's apply Snell's law to this. So Snell's law is M1. So sine theta 1, we're going to say sine theta 1 is the critical angle, so theta C, is equal to N2, and then it should be sine theta 2, but we've got sine 90. Now if you take sine 90 and you calculate it, you might already know this, but sine 90 is, zero, is uh, 1, sorry. So that's our equation. So we've got an equation here to get the critical angle. Well, we can write that sine theta C, the critical angle, is equal to N2 divided by M1. Very important for optics. And it has to be, N2 has to be less than M1. Has to be. You can do a quick test. You could put a number for N2 greater than M1 and then try to find theta C by doing the inverse sign in your calculator. And all you'll be doing is trying to do the inverse sine of a number greater than 1. And for anyone that does mathematics or did higher GCC, uh, the sine graph goes between 1 and minus 1. So you can't do the inverse sine of a number greater than 1. You'll get the math error. And physically it's the same. And that'll make sense when we do cladding in a moment. or make more sense. So get the equation. Let's move on. Let's do some practice. So let's pause and have a go. Calculate the critical angle moving from glass to air. So glass to air. So let's have a look. So the equation, sine theta c, is equal to N2 over M1. So we're going from glass to air. So air is material 2. So theta c is equal to inverse sine of 1 over 1.5. Which gives a critical angle 
of 41.8 degrees. So that means in, in this scenario, if you went in at an angle of 41.8 degrees in the line, then it would refract across the boundary at 90 degrees as that would be the critical angle. Let's move on. So this one, a bit more challenging. Let's calculate the following. There's three questions here. I need to find theta one, which is the internet angle at the top right of glass block one. Then find the refractive index of block two, and then find theta three, which is the angle in the middle. So let's pause and have a go, and then I'll take you through the answers. So theta one is just an application of Snell's law. So I'm going to write M1 sine theta one equals N2 sine theta two. So N1 is air, which is one. So we've essentially got sine theta one equals N2 sine theta two. And we want theta one. So theta one is the inverse sine of N2 sine theta two. Because remember N1 is one. So let's put some numbers in. So the first angle is the inverse sine of N2, which is 1.4, it's given there in the bottom corner. So it's 1.4 times sine of the angle, which is 21 degrees. And if you calculate that, you get an angle, theta one, that was equal to 30 degrees. I might have got rid of that a bit quick if you want to rewind and get that down, that's okay. So 30 degrees. Let's do the second bit, the refractive index of block two. So the only reason why we can find the refractive index of block two is actually this bit in the bottom corner. Because we know both angles and we know the refractive index of air on the outside, which is n equals n equals one. So we can find the refractive index of block two, which will be the first material. So we need to do sine theta two is equal to N2 over M1. And we are finding M1. So M1 is equal to N2 divided by sine of the critical angle. Now we know it's the critical angle because at 39 degrees, the incident angle, it refracts across the normal. Refracts across the boundary, sorry, at 90 degrees. So... The N2 is 1 because it's air divided by sine 39, which gives a refractive index for block 2 of 1.59. And then finally, let's find theta 3. So again, it's an application of Snell's law. So M1 sine theta 1 equal to N2 sine theta 2. So we need theta one. So theta one is equal to inverse sine. And it's N2 sine theta two divided by M1. So N2 is the refractive index of block two because that's the second material. So that'll be 1.59, which we just calculated. Multiplied by sine of the angle. So that'd be sine 57. Divided by N1, so M1 in block, in, uh, block 1 is 1.4. So that gives theta 1 equal to 72 degrees. Hopefully that went okay. Let's move on. We've got a bit more, inf some new information, a bit more, and another question. Hopefully that went okay. So optical fibers. So optical fibers are an application of total internal reflection. Step index optical fiber consists of two concentric layers of transparent material. We've got a core and a cladding, as shown in this Encyclopedia Britannica image on the right. So there's a core, a cladding, and a, a plastic coating. And as you can see, the light ray travels down the core. So the core, this is important, has a higher refractive index than the surrounding cladding layer. Very important this bomb bit. So if you want to pause and write some information down, that might be useful. And then I'll move on. Next bit, total internal reflection. 
takes place at the core, cladding boundary. The cladding layer is used to prevent light crossing from one part of the fibre to another in situations where two fibres come into contact. Such crossover would mean that signals would not be secure as they would reach the wrong destination. Now, total internal reflection occurs when the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle. It has to be greater. So we can look back to this graph, this uh, image, sorry. And if we increase the angle theta 1, so if I draw a line in here, what would actually happen is the light, instead of refracting out of the material or refracting along the boundary, would undergo total internal reflection. And the angles, theta 1, and the angle of reflection, which you should have done at GCSE, would be equivalent. So that's total internal reflection. And that is the process that allows an optical fiber to work. So let's go back to that. If you were drawing this also, remember to draw normals on. It's a, it's a decent image of this, and I'll explain why shortly. So, as this light comes in, the core is obviously more dense than the, the outside region, which is air. So it refracts towards the normal. Then it undergoes a series of total internal reflections. So as you can see, these angles are equivalent. That wasn't the neatest. These angles are equivalent. Same as these two angles, because the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection from GCC. And then as we move out, so it gets to the edge of this boundary, and it enters air, which is a less dense medium, so it will refract away from the normal. I'm just drawing the normal there. So I'll make the notes. Hopefully that's okay. And then we've got a little bit more, little bit more information as well in this session, and another question. So question first, if you want to pause and have a go. A step index fiber consists of a core of refractive index 1.55 surrounded by cladding of index 1.4. Calculate the critical angle for light in the core. So that's pretty straightforward. It's just sine theta c is equal to n2 over n1. And remember n1 must be less than n2. Sorry, greater. So in this instance, that's okay because the core has the 1.55 refractive index and the cladding has the 1.4 index. So this will work. So let's find theta C. So theta critical is N2. So that's the cladding, the 1.4, divided by the core, the 1.55. Inverse sine of this. And that gives us a critical angle that is equal to 65 degrees. So that means if light goes in greater than the critical angle, 65 degrees, it will undergo, within the wire, total internal reflection. So it has to be greater than this. So greater than the critical angle, we get total internal reflection. So greater than the critical angle, we get total internal reflection, or TIR. Then there's just a bit more information for you to write down and essentially memorize. And then we're finished. So a few notes on optical fibers in communication. So a communication optical fiber allows pulses of light to enter at one end from a transmitter to reach a receiver at the other end. The fastest broadband systems use optical fiber links. So the core must be very narrow to prevent multi-path dispersion. That's an important point. This occurs in a wide core. because light travel on the axis of the core travels a shorter distance per meter of fiber than light that repeatedly undergoes total internal reflection. So the output pulse will be broader, and such dispersion would cause an initial short pulse to lengthen as it travelled along the fibre, which we don't want. 
So a cause must be narrow. So the core being this must be kept small distance to prevent multipath dispersion. Comes up on exam questions quite regularly. So make sure this information is down and you memorize it. Then let's move on. So last but not least, just some information on the endoscope. So it's just a utilization of the phenomena, total internal reflection. There's an endoscope on the left. And all that happens is light enters, undergoes total internal reflection, is sent down the tube, comes back up, and allows doctors to look inside the human body. So the endoscope, the medical endoscope, contains two bundles of fibres. One set of fibres transmits light into a body cavity, and the other is used to return an image for observation. So this image on the right is a esophagus. That's the part of the body which food goes down, if you don't do biology. And this type of infliction is called Barrett's esophagus, which is a precancerous condition, I believe. So endoscopes are very useful, give doctors a lot of information. So if you have any discomfort in your esophagus and your stomach, stomach problems, doctors will do an endoscope and see what's happening. So physics is very important in medicine. And this is just one thing. You know, you've got MRI scanners, CT scans, etc. So physicists work very closely with the medical community to help them out. And I hope you enjoyed that lesson. Uh, I know there's a lot of information, a lot of practice in there, but hopefully it went okay. Uh, thanks for watching. I'll speak to you soon.